in book four, probably the most famous of the passages of the Aeneid. Here, uh, through his story, again, storytelling, uh, Aeneas has uh, ingratiated himself to uh, the Carthaginians, to Dido and her court. And they say, oh, great, stay here with us. You tell a good story. We love lounging around and listening to good stories, especially stories that are very rich. Get back. What's your rush? Yeah, Rome, Rome, Rome. You'll get there. You'll get there. Just hang out here with us. We got, we got good stuff here. Rome is just a bunch of pastures right now. You really want to go there? We got a city rising out of the desert. We have a great culture that's progressing. We got lots and lots of money. Uh, this is tempting. But the queen, too long she has suffered the pain of love, hour by hour nursing the wound of her lifeblood, consumed by the fire buried in her heart. The man's courage, the sheer pride of his line, they all came pressing home to her over and over. Her, his looks, his words, they pierced the heart and clanged no peace, no rest for her body. Love will give her none. Now, again, I'm kind of uh, pumping up the volume on the melodrama there in the reading, but not that much. The words are doing it for me. They are squeezing the emotion of the moment. And her perspective is very, very emotional. She is consumed by the fire buried in her heart. Now, fire is a... Uh, foreboding for her end at the end of this chapter, but it's also a sign of passion. She is passionate, and she indulges those passions over and over. She dwells on his looks, his words. Every poet likes to think that words are very powerful. Um, they pierce the heart and cling they don't appeal to the mind necessarily. She's not that concerned with that. She is giving herself over to oh, the decadence. Mm. Um, this is important. She is a, throughout, you have these images of the Carthaginians wallowing in a kind of luxury. The descriptions of the palace are all very ornate. They're dripping in gold, which is a stark contrast to the simplicity of the Roman style. Think in terms of, you know, uh, again, we can go back to architecture or, you know, city design or something. Think about the difference between you know, Washington, D.C., which is all these white columns and dignified, official-looking, sturdy buildings, not too fancy, not too flashy, and then compare that with, let's say, Vegas, which is all neon lights and flashing brightness and wow! Very different aesthetics, very different perspectives, very different worldviews, very different cultures. And this is significant because in this little city with all this going on, Aeneas eh, is starting to like Vegas. He's hitting the craps tables, staying up until three. Hey, you know, you go see a Celine Dion show and you have a good time. Pretty soon you're a native. Um,
Dido is uh, infatuated. I think that's fair to say. Dido is giving in to her uh, lusts, prodded a little bit by Cupid. Um, all of this instigated by Juno, troublesome woman. They go out for a walk, casual little group outing. You know, ah, let's go for a little walk. Juno sends in storm, rain, oh, rain and wind. Oh, just, it's, it's like the notebook when you see them in the rain. Everything, everybody looks sexy in the rain, I guess. I don't know. Um, you know, I've never seen the notebook. But I've seen, like, the image of the two of them, and it's, you know, eh, what are you going to do? The goddess arranges for, you know, uh, this is a large group. You know, the queen doesn't travel without an entourage. But for some reason, they all scatter the minute the rain shows up. And Dido and Aeneas get sort of escorted off. And look, there's a cave. Just shelter from the storm and they go in there and they're wet <sighs> but it's not cold wet because you know it's uh, it's carthage it's north africa so they're they're warm but they're wet one thing leads to another bada bing bada boom there is a hint that this is a marriage of sorts the gods are calling it a marriage. Dido interprets it as a marriage. Um, Aeneas a little less so. You know, uh, Aeneas probably keeps on the, uh, you know, the status. It's complicated. Whereas Dido is clearly saying married. Um, familiar dynamics. But the gods um, do not like this. Um, Jupiter, Jove, Zeus, uh, is particularly outraged. Um, not for... Take my commands, this is like line 283 or so. Take my commands through the racing winds. He's talking to Mercury, who is Hermes, the messenger god. Take my commands through the racing winds and tell him this is not the man his mother, the lovely god, has promised. Not for this did she save him twice from Greek attacks. You know. Um, the parents never really approve. Um, never! He wouldn't be the one to master in Italy, rife with leaders, shrill in the, with the cries of war, uh, to sire a people sprung from Teucer's noble blood and bring the entire world beneath the rule of law. Yeah. The rule of law is interesting there because the Romans were famous for instituting a, a body of law and they were a serious uh, uh, government in that aspect. Although they were also, let's face it, an empire, and the emperor was kind of the law. Um, <clears throat> but still, it's an image of, uh, you know, uh, the entire world. Somewhat grand. And remember, at this point, the, uh, the empire, uh, it's big, but it wants to get a lot bigger. And this is saying, it's all yours. Go for it. Job commands, let him set sail. That is the sum of it. This must be our message. So he sends Mercury down to smack Aeneas into shape. Get him off his butt. He goes down there and he finds Aeneas. Soon as his winged feet touch down on the first huts in sight, he spots Aeneas founding the city fortifications, building homes in Carthage. Whoa! Now he's not just sitting around kicking back, you know. 
Club Med Carthage. Now he's taking part in building the city. Now, I point out again, Carthage is not just another city. Carthage is the primary opponent, the rival of Rome for a hundred years before this. It is the uh, it is the rival for against whom three separate wars, the Punic Wars, are fought. Many, many people killed over the span of more than a hundred years. Now, all of this is in the recent past. It's been a hundred years since the last Punic War when Carthage was basically leveled. Roman soldiers went and just <laughs> wiped it off the map. Um, but still, the notion of the father of Rome helping build the enemy that would cause so much tragedy. This is, you know, that's tough to swallow. And look how he is discussed here. And his sword hilt is studded with tawny jasper stars. He has a very fancy sword, lots of jewels. A cloak of glowing Tyrian purple drapes his shoulders, a gift that the wealthy queen had made herself, weaving into the weft a glinting mesh of gold. Why are they dwelling on these details? A glinting mesh of gold. Why these details? Hmm? Clivin? Why these details? Why all the gold? It all sounds kind of fancy, doesn't it? Kind of luxurious. Ooh, a purple cloak. Purple is the color of royalty. It's kind of a sense of decadence. It's not a simple Roman, unfancy warrior aesthetic. Remember again, Octavian's short hair? We're serious. We don't go in for all that luxurious stuff. We're real men. Manly men. Uh, Mercury lashes out at once. You! So now you lay foundation stones for the soaring walls of Carthage, building her gorgeous city, doting on your wife? See, he's calling her a wife, too. Doting on your wife, too. I love that. Doting on your wife. That is the crime. Not unlike, you know, Adam and Eve. Listening to your wife is Adam's first sin. Doting on your wife. What are you? Woman? Blind to your own realm, oblivious to your fate. Again and again and again. Castigating, prodding, telling him your fate awaits you. You have a duty to it. It's not just an abstract thing. It's your son. Your son will found Rome. You have a duty to him. And all that he represents, which is the entire line which ultimately will encompass the world, of course, or, you know, control it. Um, at least remember Ascanius rising into his prime, the hopes you lodge in Iulius, your only heir. You owe him Italy's realm, the land of Rome. This order still on his lips, the god vanished from sight into empty air. That is his closing argument. You owe him Rome. Don't screw around with that. Don't just get lazy. Don't just ease into this comfortable, cushy little spot.
Then Aeneas was truly overwhelmed by the vision, stunned, his hackles bristle with fear, his voice chokes in his throat. Again, he's having a little hissy fit here. Um, he yearns to be gone, to desert this land he loves, thunderstruck by the warnings, Jupiter's command. But what can he do? What can he dare say now to the queen in all her fury to win her over? He sounds again kind of like the, uh, the, the whiny little bitch. He doesn't know what to do. He's, he's having a moment. Oh, the gods tell me I have to leave. He seems genuinely torn right now, but he's not really that torn. Maybe he is on the inside, but he doesn't really spend a lot of time sweating it. Um, how does Dido take it? Hmm? Bark it? Well, uh, okay, but, you know, again, pump the brakes a little. We don't want to go, don't go to the end. Spoiler alert! Everybody's read it. Um, how does she take it at first? Badly! I like the understatement. How very Roman of you. Simple, plain, unadorned. She takes it badly. <laughs> Um, you could argue that again. This is a. This is not necessarily a uh, uh, a bad. This isn't necessarily a uh, a un unidentifiable reaction. She takes it badly. They are, in her mind, at least, married. Or, you know, they have an understanding. Um, and he just comes home one day, or actually he doesn't even do that. He just starts packing up. He tells his, uh, he tells his crew, uh, yeah, uh, well, start loading the ships. Uh, you know, uh, try and keep it on the down low. Just, you know, start getting the provisions on board. And, you know, we're, we're going to leave soon. Just get, keep it to yourselves. Don't, don't. Don't let the word get out. Uh, she finds out. They have a nice little thing about rumor as an unstoppable force. And again, rumor kind of acts like unchecked nature, something that just speeds out of control. And you can see also that Virgil, as a court player, as somebody who is used to operating within a royal court, understands the power of rumor in a closed, circular little society where everybody's sort of watching and you know, jostling for power and favor with the big boss and everybody's got knives out because it's very political. Rumor is a very real thing in politics and that's what uh, Virgil is writing from there. But here, Dido finds out kind of on her own and puts two, to, two and two together because uh, Aeneas does not have the uh, fortitude shall we say, to come right out and admit it. Say, hun, we've had some good times, but I think we both know where this is going. He's just ready to sneak off in the middle of the night. Again, not that hard to understand the human dynamics here. Um, she does not take it well. Like line uh, 387 or so. You're running away from me? Notice that dash in between. You're running away from me. So first it's the act itself, but kind of in a vacuum. And then she amps it up by personalizing it. It's not just that he's running away, which is kind of a, you know, uh, kind of a jerk move perhaps. But... She takes it that one extra step to get it about her. Everything's about her. It's self-indulgent. Oh, I pray you by these tears, by the faith in your right hand, what else I, have I left myself in all my pain? By our wedding vows, 
the marriage we began, if I deserve some decency from you now, if anything mine has ever won your heart. Pity the great house about to fall. I pray you, if prayers have any place, reject this scheme of yours. She spins out of control pretty quickly. This is not, you know, a rational response. It's understandable, it's very human, but she takes it up a notch. Um, if only you'd left a baby in my arms, our child, before you deserted me, some little Aeneas playing it about in our halls, whose features at last would bring you back to me in spite of it all. I would not feel so totally dis devastated, so destroyed. You know, all right. It sucks to get dumped, but totally devastated, destroyed. She's losing perspective. She is losing that sense of faith, that sense of dignity. She is not a... She is not uh, restraining her emotions and just doing what needs to be done. In this moment, a proper Roman would perhaps keep it all inside, agree, and, you know, spend the... Uh, spend the rest of her life hating him. But from a public perspective, it's like fighting in front of the kids in a divorce. You maintain a certain decorum, a certain <sighs> reserve for the kids' sake. Here, consider also the parallel in Medea. Medea does not take her breakup well either. Um, da, 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 At last he ventured, Aeneas ventured a few words. I, you have done me so many kindnesses, and you could and you could count them all. I should I shall never deny what you deserve, my queen, never regret my memories of Dido, not while I can recall myself and draw the breath of life. I'll state my case in a few words. I'll state my case. Like he's, you know, making an argument in a courtroom. Probably not the most diplomatic way to diffuse this situation. Maybe he should get a little bit more emotional here to keep things calm from her perspective, but he is putting up that wall. He is putting up that exterior. Again, think of the difference in the opening scene of when he's basically pooping his pants in the storm and then cut to a scene of him just on the beach later with his men and putting up the brave face and saying, Yes, we're having a hard time, but someday you're going to look back on this and think, that was our finest hour. He has that ability. Um, I never dreamed I'd keep my flight a secret, which is probably a lie. Don't imagine that. Nor did I once extend a bridegroom's torch or enter into a marriage pact with you. Yeah. Again, from his perspective, it's probably true, but maybe not the most uh, smooth way to diffuse an irrational uh, woman at this moment. If the fates had left me free to live my life, to arrange my own affairs of my own free will, Troy is the city, first of all, that I'd safeguard. Again, kind of blaming it on fate. If... What? Uh, uh, Troy and all that's left of my people whom I cherish, the grand palace of Priam would stand once more. With my own hands I would fortify a second Troy to house my Trojans in defeat, but not now. Grinian Apollo's oracle says I must seize on Italy's noble land. His Lycian lot say, Italy! There lies my love, there lies my homeland now. You, if you a Phoenician, 
fix your eyes on Carthage, a Libyan stronghold. Tell me, why do you grudge the Trojans their new homes on Italian soil? Again, he's sort of pointing out that she is an exile too. Like Medea. But he is abstracting this whole thing. He's depersonalizing it. She keeps saying, you know, you're leaving me. She is always making it about her. Very self-indulgent. And he is saying, no, let's look at the bigger picture. This is the gods doing, and it's all about Troy and Rome and Phoenicia and Carthage. And these are all very abstract notions. And we don't need to get hysterical. Let's just deal with it in a very simple way. Um, she will not do that. Line 4, 56 or so. Till abruptly her eyes cried out in a blaze of fury. Blaze, <laughs> fire imagery. Well, we know what's coming. Uh, fury, she is irrational. No goddess was your mother. You know, she is making it now about him. She is personalizing it. You know, you whore, you son of a whore. Yeah, she is getting nasty in this. Again, indulging in the emotionalism of it. Um, there's no faith left on earth. Nusquam tuta fides. Here she is saying that this tragedy in her life is reflective of a world, a universe at this point, without um, without divine morals. So she is taking her misfortune at this moment and catastrophizing to such a degree that it becomes a universal statement. Casting herself thus in this moment, nusquam tuta fides, as lost to civilization because she is no longer faithful. She has no pietas in the religious sense of the word. Um, what work for the gods who live on high? What concerns to ruffle their repose? Again, she's kind of mocking them. You know, eh, that's not cool. Um, but Aeneas is driven by duty now, like line 495, strongly as he longs to ease and allay her sorrow, speak to her, turn away her anguish with reassurance, still moaning deeply, heart shattered by his great love. In spite of all, he obeys the gods' commands, and back he goes to his ships. Watch this. Then the Trojans throw themselves in the labor, launching their tall vessels down into the beach, and the hull rubs sleek with pitch floats high again. So keen to be gone, the men drag down from the forest untrimmed timbers and boughs still green for oars. You can see them streaming out of the whole city, men like ants that, wary of winter's onset, pillage some huge pile of wheat to store away in their grange, and their army's long black line goes marching through the field, trundling their spoils down some cramped grassy track. Some put shoulders to giant grains and thrust them on. Some dress the ranks, strictly martial stragglers, and the whole trail seethes with labor. Again, a passionate endorsement of work this image of the heroic quality of work of labor men in this construction are ants just like we saw they were bees in another moment they are workers they're doing the job they do what they have to do this is what an empire is built on workers people who get out there and do the work without a lot of recognition, without a lot of individualization. Not everyone can be Aeneas, but here the greater hero at this moment is the mass of workers. It's almost communism, not quite. But just in that heroic no notion of it, uh, Marx probably liked that. Um, Ah, 
She does not take it well. He doesn't seem to care. He packs up and leaves. She watches his ships leaving the harbor. And she has this long speech of uh, great passion. And you can really feel her pain. At the same time that she seems like, you know, she, she's gone around the bend a little bit. She keeps it so understandable. Virgil keeps her so understandable in this moment of abandonment that you can really feel the conflict. You know, you, you just want to go give her a hug. You, sun, whose fires scan all works of the earth, and you, Juno, the witness, midwife to my agonies, Hecate gre greeted by nightly shrieks at, at city crossroads, and you, you avenging furies and gods of dying Dido, hear me and turn your power my way. Attend my sorrows. I deserve your mercy. Hear my prayers. She's really ringing it out. She's basically, you know, uh, she's, she's squeezing the rag a couple too many times here. But you can sense that passion. If that curse of the earth must reach his haven, that curse of the earth, uh, Aeneas, labor on to landfall. If Jove and the fates command and the boundary stone is fixed, still let him be plagued in war by a nation proud in arms. And here... The little hairs on the back of every Roman's neck stands up because they know what's happening. Dido is essentially the founder of Carthage, and she is taking her personal wrath and pointing it at the future and saying, we are now enemies, and I will avenge my pain upon you. Torn from its borders, wrenched from Ulysses' embrace, let him grovel for help and watch his people die a shameful death. And then, once he is bowed down to an unjust peace, may he never enjoy his realm and the light he yearns for. Never let him die before this day, unburied on some desolate beach. And again, we have the beach imagery thrown in. Complicating. That is my prayer, my final cry. I pour it out with my own lifeblood. And you, my Tyrians, harry with hatred all his line. Take it out on the future of Rome. His race to come, make that offering to my ashes. Send it down below. No love between our peoples, ever. No pacts of peace. Come rising up from my bones, you avenger still unknown. And here she's all but name-checking Hannibal, the, uh, the general who led uh, in the Second Punic War, their greatest hero. To stalk those Trojan settlers, hunt with fire and iron now or in time to come, whenever the power is yours, shore clash with shore, sea against sea, and sword against sword. That is my curse. War between all our peoples, all their children, endless war. Wow. Uh, again, she doesn't take the breakup well. She is... She is forecasting the entire history of her civilization at that moment. Here's another example of etiology, of how things came to be. Why does Carthage and Rome hate one another? Why do they hate one another? Because of this. Because out of the personal, great tragedy occurs. Devastation, destruction, for her case, the entire city leveled, all because of this very personal, deeply felt emotional conflict. If you don't keep a handle on them, bad things can grow from them. 
This plants a seed that will flourish in misery for centuries to come. This is Rome pointing out, or Virgil pointing out, that history has consequences. Aeneas just sails off peacefully. He looks over his shoulders. He sees, ah, oh, the palace is burning. Yeah, I guess she's, uh, she's dying there. Ah, oh, well, what's next? Um, but that moment is so important because he doesn't understand the conflict of the emotion. He is... And I think this is Virgil pointing out in this poem that there is a price to pay for being too unemotional on the surface. I think he's pointing out that that conflict is very human and needs to be considered. And because it is so human, it, it should be considered by art. This is stuff that Homer really doesn't get into. Homer is uh, a little less, uh, he dwells a little less on the squishy emotions of things. And so that creates an expectation, well, maybe that's just not a proper thing for art, especially grand epic art that is supposed to tell of heroes and gods and the founding of nations. Virgil is recentering that and saying, well, yeah, but that's all very exterior. There is an interior value that we need to pay attention to. And the conflict between that exterior and the interior, finding a negotiation between those two realms, that is a proper focus for art. Human beings and their feelings have value and can and should be represented in art. And that is a radical, radical idea. And it will take several centuries for that to really come to fruition.